Jesus said, uh, sanctify them by thy word, thy word, thy word, not my opinion, thy word, not my belief system, thy word, not my feelings and emotions, but thy word is truth. And I want you to look at somebody and just reassure them the word of the Lord is truth. The word of the Lord is truth. And I'm thankful for his word because his word is quick and powerful. What I love about God's word is it doesn't just deal with actions. If God's word only dealt with the actions, it would only deal with the symptom of the issue. Because you have to understand action is a symptom. The issue is much deeper than that. But the Bible says that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is so powerful it goes past my action. And it goes even to the intent, the very thought and intent of my heart. What I think and what I intend, not even before, before I even act upon it, it deals with my intention. And that's the reason why we must cast down every thought and every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I have come to the realization in my lifetime that my best attempt to think like God is an exercise in futility. There is absolutely no ability for this carnal mind to comprehend, to even consider that God had no beginning, that he has always been, always will be. He's eternal. That is hard for my mind to wrap itself around because in this finite human condition, everything has a beginning and all things have an end. And so just that simple thing is difficult for me to wrap my mind around. So if I had to come up with a God all by myself, I couldn't come up with an infinite, eternal God. I would have to come up with a God who began somewhere and who will eventually end somewhere because that is my human concept of life. But God's thoughts are not my thoughts, and neither are his ways my ways. Uh, I use the scripture a lot, but I'm trying to get that into our spirits because way too many Christians are living off thought. They're living off thought instead of truth. And he said, if you could measure my thoughts as it uh, pertained to the, in contrast to your thoughts, he said it would be as far as the heavens are above the earth. It would be immeasurable. It would be impossible for you to even attain to my ability to think. I love that scripture. If God could be foolish, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. If God could be foolish, his foolishness would be wiser than man's wisdom. <laughs> God. Ah. I want to I talk to us tonight from this subject. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? One of the issues this generation of Christians is facing is the utter confusion about Jesus, the church, and the ministry. It's total confusion, absolute chaos in our minds. And saints of God, that's the reason why even Paul urged the saints to be noble Bereans, to go home and search the scriptures to see if those things be so. Because sound bites are not a substitute for study. Memes are not a substitute for the word of God. Um, fancy and catchy quotes are not a substitute for the scriptures. The word of God is true. And that's what we must rely on is that every word that has come out of his mouth, all scripture, everybody say all scripture. There are people that say, I don't, I don't, I don't deal with the Pauline epistles because I just deal with the gospels. Okay. Others say, I don't deal with the Old Testament. I just deal with the New Testament. 
But the word of God says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Thank God. For reproof, for rebuke, and for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The word of God is not just sent as an inspirational book to cause me to grow in confidence in myself. Actually, the word of God does quite the opposite. It causes me to realize how inept and inadequate I am, but it does grow my confidence in God because I realize that without him, I am nothing. Without him, I am at best wicked and without him, I am at best wretched. But because of him, I am a child of the living God. And because of his benevolent mercy, we have been given access to the word of God so that our predetermined position in God can be realized, and that is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. This generation, and, 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 and again, saints, what I'm saying, I'm saying for direction. I'm, I'm not trying to insult you. But we cannot get saved and then have a PhD in theology. The more I learn about God, the more I realize I didn't know about him. I, I was a young and arrogant Christian. I was. I'll be honest about that. And I thought, man, these old geezers, they didn't know nothing. Xander's generation calls them old heads. Them old heads. Didn't know anything. But the more I grow in the knowledge of God, the more I wished I had more time with them. I wouldn't bring them back for anything. But I wished I had more time with them to hear and to learn. My grandfather told me one time, and it was such a powerful statement, I've never forgotten it. He said, Jared, do you know why God gave you two ears and one mouth? He's trying to tell me something. I didn't get it until later on. He said, it's so that you can listen twice as much as you talk. My grandfather also was famous for saying, a closed mouth makes a wise head. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a hard one, but that was true. So many people, and it's not just Christians, really. It's just a generational issue we're fighting. Children think they're wiser than parents. Employees think they're smarter than bosses. Students think they're more intelligent than teachers. We're having an upside down issue right now that can only be fixed if we turn it right side up. Amen. And so people come with that same arrogant spirit into the body of Christ. And they assume because now I'm a Christian and I'm saved that I already possess deep knowledge of God. Man, I wish that were true, but that is not together true at all. In fact, it's absolutely the opposite. And that's the reason why when Christ was beginning to use metaphors, he called them born again and babes. Babes, just newborn babes. The Bible said as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. The reason why he said that is because he wanted us to understand we've got a lot of babies in this church, don't we? Got a lot of babies, and I thank God for that. I love to hear the sound of children in the church. The thing about babies is babies can't talk until they learn how to. Write that one down. This is the reason why Paul took a sabbatical after his conversion and kept quiet the whole time he was gone. It wasn't because he was disillusioned. It wasn't even because Paul wasn't an intelligent man. In fact, he said concerning the law, I was blameless. He said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was taught under the feet of Gamaliel, who was widely considered one of the most powerful theological minds within Judaism of his day. But when Paul came to Jesus, he realized, this is all dung. 
It means nothing. I'm now going to have to learn all over again. And this is where we must bring Christians. I want to encourage them to give their testimonies about how God's moving in their life. But I don't want them to be in a position of instruction. I don't want to be them, them to be in a position of teaching. I want them to celebrate the goodness of God, to shout from the rooftops the greatness of the name of Jesus. But wisdom is gained over time. Knowledge does not equal wisdom. Because wisdom... It's knowledge and experience. It's when the word of God is experienced. So I have wisdom pretty much immediately to tell people about the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I've got an experience. So immediately I can tell them. I can talk to them about being baptized in the name of Jesus. Why? Because I have the experience. But then when it comes to deep theological matters, that's the time to learn. And the problem is, is we've, Got almost an arrogance amongst Christianity at this day that, man, I just know so much. And I was that person too until I got around people that knew way more than I did. One of those men that really humbled me was Brother Deloy Smith. He humbled me. Whew. That man in his prime was powerfully theological. Oh my gosh. His intelligence, his understanding, his wisdom. And when I got around him and I began to spout my great knowledge, he would just look at me and smile. And then he would say, but have you considered this? By the time he was done, I was like, okay, I'm wrong again. I'm wrong again. Okay, I get it. I'm wrong again. But it's God allowed me to understand through that relationship that his years of study were unmatched when it compared to my years of study. And I could learn from him, even though when I first met him, I thought he could learn from me. Amen. They're zealous, but their knowledge isn't strong enough to condition their zeal. The wisdom isn't there. I did not have necessarily a spiritual father when I was first setting out in ministry, and that was hurtful to me. That, that was harmful to me. Most of the things that I know now, I've got all kinds of knots all over my head. Amen. I think one young man in here knows about knots on his head. Because I kept running into things I didn't see. Come on, somebody. I kept running headlong into things I wasn't looking for. And it caused me over and over again to learn through pain and suffering. But God has brought us into a place where there are people of great zeal, people of great knowledge, and people of wonderful wisdom. And all of that must work together to train up all of us considering what status of growth we're in. Because you have to understand everybody in the church is not at the same place. And you're, you don't have to run to catch up with anybody. You're going to learn, grow as you mature in Christ. And that maturity is dictated by the pace that the Lord has set, not the pace that peer pressure puts upon you. But we must be willing to learn. Paul said this of, 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 of the Jews in Romans 10 and verse 1. He said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Their knowledge, their wisdom, their understanding was not conditioning their zeal. And what were they doing as a result? He said, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They were hurting themselves because they were zealous, but they were without understanding. And I think we have to come to that place as children of God where we realize newborn believers are just newborn believers. And we got to be patient and merciful and kind and long-suffering, but also the newborn believers have to be willing to say, I don't know everything, I'm not as smart as I thought I was in it, and I'm not as wise as I am. And I'm going to tell you something, children of God. I've run into parents that have never raised children, but the moment they got pregnant, they had a Ph.D. in children child psychology. 
They knew everything they were and weren't going to do with their children and they knew exactly how they were going to raise them and how they were going to deal with them and instruct them. Then they had them. You know what children will teach you? Is you don't know how to raise children. (laughs) And then they get teenagers. And you wonder if you should have had children. (laughs) Can I get a witness of any of the people that have raised teenagers around here? You're like, my God in heaven. I don't think I was cut out for this, Lord. But it's a humbling process. The beautiful thing is we are in the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, there are people that possess wisdom in areas that I don't possess, but I must be humble enough in order to acknowledge that I don't possess that wisdom and I must seek for those that have it. God. Solomon said this in Proverbs 4. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Well, how do you get wisdom? You can get it one of two ways. You can get it through pain and suffering, or you can get it by going around people that have it and take it from them. Oh, come on. God doesn't keep elder saints in the church just to warm pews, fill seats. That's not why they're here. They're here because God's bringing in young people that need what they have. We were just speaking about Sister Donna outside. Just speaking about her. And I miss her so much. Because she possessed wisdom. But one thing that I learned, and I'm so grateful. I told told Brother Brent, I said, at times I felt like that I was so unworthy to pastor these people. My God, when I think about the people that the Lord brought into my midst to shepherd them. There were times I thought, God, why would you? Why would you do that for me? Why would you give me that honor? But really, after years of walking with them, I realized that they were there for me to take from just as much as I was there for them to take from. And I thank God for their wisdom, and I miss them so dearly because they were so full of wisdom. Uh, There are times I call Brother Marlowe and I talk to him because he's got years in pastoring and he's so full of wisdom. And I've, I've come to the maturity. See, one thing about maturity, when people are immature, they know it all. When people are mature, they don't know as much as they think they did. You can tell a person's maturity by their humility and knowledge. And there are times I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle a situation. And I think I'll pray and ask God and God will say, call Brother Marlowe. Call Brother Deloy. Call one of these elder men. They've been there, Jared. They know what they're doing. They know they, they've done this before. So talk to them and get wisdom. And so you know what I do? I, hang, I, 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 I get my phone and I call them and call them until I get an answer because I want from them what they have before they're gone and I can't get it anymore. Ah, God. Zeal, though often powerful and impacting, is dangerous without knowledge, and it becomes unprofitable. Zeal actually can become unprofitable when one refuses knowledge. My dad used to tell me, uh, we'd be moving things around the house, and he would say, son, you're like a bull in a china shop. Because I had all kinds of energy and strength and I was going to get it done. I was knocking over this. I was banging against this. I was hitting against this. And and let me tell you, when we go to move in, y'all watch the woodwork. (laughs) Oh, I never appreciated that until now. After hours and hours and hours of sanding, I'm going to be going, oh, 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 (laughs) oh. Amen. Glory to God. Zeal without knowledge causes a person to be a bull in a china shop. They got all kinds of energy, all kinds of strength, but they're wrecking everything because they don't have the knowledge to condition that strength and to condition that energy. This is the reason why the importance and priority of doctrine is being revealed to us day by day as we look into the future. 
The Lord said this through the prophet Hosea in Hosea 4 and 6. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge. It's not that the knowledge is not there. It's they don't want it. It's not that the understanding is not there. They just refuse it. And the only reason why you would reject knowledge is number one, because it convicts you, or number two, because you already think you know. God, help us to not be know-it-alls. You can't have a lack of knowledge and a lack of wisdom and come in amongst people that have been walking with God and give direction and demand change. You can't do it. Why? Because oftentimes, listen, there are times I have made changes in this church out of desire and emotion and a feeling. You know what happened? Crash and burn. Why? Because I had a desire, but I didn't have the knowledge. Now, years later, I'm like, man, I, I would have, man, what? Y'all don't know how many times. Y'all don't know how many times. I know people think I'm an arrogant something or another, but y'all don't know how many times I'm driving in my car down the road, and I'm like, why did you do that? That was so dumb. Why did you do that? The little flash, and it's just to humble me. It's just to keep me like, hey, you remember when you screwed that up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't get so arrogant. Don't get so prideful. You remember when you jacked that up? Yeah, I had it working just perfectly for you, and you thought it needed to be better. What do you think now? And I'm like, oh, God, help me. He said they have rejected knowledge. And he said, and because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. He said, thou shalt, not be, thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. My God, help us not to reject knowledge. Misconception is the mother of confusion. When I see something that I think should be a way versus the way it should be, misconception is the mother of confusion. So how the world perceives Jesus has confused them as to actually who Jesus is. I'm going to tell you what the world thinks of Jesus. The world thinks Jesus is a long-haired hippie with rainbows on his head, sitting around a campfire, smoking peyote, singing kumbaya. That's who they think he is. They say, oh, well, he was meek and lowly. He was. We'll not argue with that. But there was also another side to Jesus. And see, when you have a misconception of Jesus, the real Jesus is going to hurt your feelings. Real Jesus is going to mess you up. I had one lady tell me one time when I was, I was preaching at a youth thing and, and I was talking about holiness and I was going right down the line scripturally and she said, my Jesus is not like that. In fact, it was due to the condition that her husband was unsaved and he wasn't going to go into the kingdom unsaved. And she said, my Jesus isn't like that. My Jesus wouldn't do that. And I said, there is the problem. You have conformed him to your image while he's trying to conform you to his. You have another Jesus, and your Jesus is your carnal mind. The problem with that is the carnal mind is enmity against God. It cannot be subject to the law of God, will not, neither indeed can be. So be careful how you perceive Jesus. Amen. Well, I heard pastor so-and-so on TBN say, be careful how you perceive Jesus. Well, I was watching YouTube and this preacher said, be careful how you perceive Jesus. Because if you think that Jesus was some weak, lowly person that it was just there to be run over and trampled on like a rug, you have the wrong Jesus. If you think Jesus was only there to encourage and to lift up and never to confront, you have the wrong Jesus. Come on, somebody. The danger of this is that a lack of knowledge is deception. 
I'll say that again. A lack of knowledge is already deception. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1 through 4, he said, Would to God you bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. Paul said, my job was to espouse you to Christ and then to work until you were a chaste virgin. It is a miracle. It is a phenomena that can only happen within the body of Christ. The Bible said that Jesus is coming after a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. How's he going to do that? Because the Bible said he washes it by the water of the word. The word of God is not sent to reaffirm who I am in the flesh. It is actually a cross that was sent to crucify me. Until the old man died. And until Christ be formed in me. That's the reason why we have to be careful when we try to convince people that because at some point they have believed on Christ, they have all they need. It's not scriptural. It is in fact contrary and antithetical to the word of God because Paul said, my little children of whom I travail in birth until, until Christ be formed in you. In other words, you're not there yet. But I'm travailing. He said, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. You gotta be careful, saints, because there is a way to form words from the word that are so subtle that if you are not established in the word it will deceive you to believe in another Jesus it will deceive you to receive another gospel it will deceive you that you have another spirit and that spirit is not God he said for if he that Cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we've not preached or you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might bear well with him he said look he said if you're not careful if you're not careful these heretics will come in among you and they will preach this false doctrine and because of subtlety you'll accept it and you will bear with them but Paul said when there came certain from Jerusalem to spy out the liberty which we had in Christ Jesus. We gave them no subjection. No, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might remain with you. He said we shut them down so that you would not be deceived. God in heaven. I know people don't like control because they're undisciplined and they don't like discipline in their homes and they don't like discipline at the job and they don't like discipline at the church but there has to come a point saints where we hunger for that discipline where we desire for that order God help us to be where we need to be so that we are safe it's not about control it's about safety it's about safety for your children it's about safety for your grandchildren this is the danger of the lack of knowledge 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9 Paul speaking of the false prophet the antichrist even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders it's a reason why I'm real concerned. I believe that God does miracles. I believe that God does wonders. But these signs shall follow. They don't precede us. They follow us. Come on, somebody. In other words, I'm not looking for them. <laughs> I'd have to turn around just to see them. Come on, somebody. And so when we're seeking signs and wonders, we're already in real trouble. He said, and with the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, why? 
because they received not a love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. This is the reason why doctrine is so important. This is the reason why understanding is so important. Having been born again, we must immediately assume our ignorance to the things of God. There, we, we had one brother came in, and I was so thankful that God permitted it. He was in his mid-80s, and he had never served God. He was a backslider, an unbeliever. He wasn't even a backslider. He was just an unbeliever, an ungodly man. But God allowed him to come in, get saved, filled him with his spirit. But that man in his mid-80s was like handling a baby. Because though he was an older man, he was completely ignorant to the things of God. And he would ask me questions that a baby Christian would ask. You would sit there and you would think, my goodness, this man's in his mid-80s. But if you've never served God, you don't know him. And the only way to know him is by his word. Hallelujah. Sound bites and snippets of sermons on YouTube are no replacement for study. Sounds right doesn't equal is right. I said, sounds right, doesn't equal is right. I'm on somebody. People have a problem with me when I come down hard at times on the church. They do. I get a lot of flack from that. And they say, it's because you don't have a Christ-like spirit because Christ wouldn't do that. The only reason why people make those statements is because they're ignorant to the word of God. They're expressing ignorance is what they're doing. I don't even know if it's antagonistic. I just think it's ignorance. Because in Matthew 12 and 23, he called the Pharisees and the Sadducees vipers. He said, you're a bunch of snakes. My Jesus wouldn't talk like that. Are you sure about that? You sure about that? Matthew 16, he called Peter Satan. My Jesus wouldn't talk like that to people. Look at somebody and tell them, are you sure about that? John 6, he called one of his disciples a devil. He said, I've chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil. <laughs> My God. <laughs> you may have a misconception of Jesus if you don't know this one. If you don't know, you may just, all you may perceive of Jesus is his miracles. But there was also a master. Ah, God in heaven. Well, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. That may be the Jesus that you see. But in John 2, Jesus walks in, or in John, Jesus walks in to Jerusalem. And he's standing in a corner. And he walks into the temple. And he's watching them. All of a sudden, he pulls to himself a strand of cord. And the more he sees it, the more angry he's getting. Because you must remember, there is righteous indignation. Because his father's house was to be called the house of prayer. And he said, you've made it a den of thieves. Jesus is in real PR trouble here, guys. Because in the modern church, if you were a PR professional, You'd say, Jesus, before you could do anything crazy, before you just go off half cocked here, hold up. Because if you do anything real crazy here, people are not going to like you. And in order for us to build the empire that we're trying to build, we need people to like you. Put that whip down. First off, that's a bad idea. Because you start whipping people, nobody's going to think that you're sane. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Talk to them about taking the money they're making and financing the work of God. Even though they're thieves. Let's, let's try a little PR here. Or you could say, guys, don't know if the sanctuary is the right place for this. But if you just go out into the courtyard here, you know, I'm, who am I to judge? <laughs> I 
he sits there and starts winding that thing. And he's getting more angry and more angry because they're using the house of God for ill intent. And he starts swinging that whip, turning over tables. And the Bible said he drove them out of the temple. My Jesus, he's not aggressive. He's not abrasive. Are you sure about that? A woman comes to him whose daughter is grievously vexed of the devil. And he says, woman, first off, who you calling woman? You know, you could have said ma'am, sister, lady. He said woman, it's not meat for me to give the children's bread to dogs. <laughs> oh, whoa, Jesus, whoa, 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 we got a real problem here. You start calling women dogs. Ain't no women coming to your church. <laughs> so I think the best, you could say, yeah, I'm at a loss on this one. I, I don't know how to clean this one up, Lord. You've really got a PR problem here. The reason why people have such a problem is because they're ignorant to the word of God. They have this Jesus that has been painted to them by the world church that actually does not resemble the Jesus of the word. Has nothing to do with him. Has nothing to do with him. He said, he told them that he said, you're a bunch of whited sepulchers. Your tombs. Ain't nothing in you but death. You're full of excess and extortion. You hypocrites, you blind guides. Oh, my Jesus. Jesus, what you could go to them and say is, guys, I know we have a little misunderstanding here. You know, and, and maybe if we could just sit down, reason this thing out, and, 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 you know, I'm not trying to get you to believe what I believe. I don't want to force my religion on you. You know, but if we could sit down, because here's the deal. It's peace at all costs. We don't want all this upheaval. I mean, really, you know, now that I have developed the spirit of Christ, took me 33 years to do it, but now that I've developed the spirit of Christ, why don't we just kind of let bygones be bygones? And I'm going to get up, and I'm going to give inspirational sermons, and we're all going to be happy, and we're going to sit around, and we're all going to talk about how much we love one another. It's going to be great. Because really, I mean, what you believe is not really that far from In fact, my whole religion that I'm producing here is deeply rooted in yours. So, guys, come on. we got to find some middle ground. He said, you generation of vipers, you hypocrites. You blind guides, you serpents, your tombs, your whitewashed tombs, you're full of excess and extortion. Ooh, I have to wonder, then what Jesus are you talking about? Because I've just given you the word of God and the word of God don't look like your Jesus. Somebody said, well, you know, Paul was our apostle. And Paul, I, I think he would be, I think he'd be more careful, intelligent man, spent years just thinking about this thing. He probably would be a little bit easier when it came to the saints. Okay, well, let's go to Titus 1 and, and verse 10. You say, why are you talking about this pastor because if we don't understand the ministry we are going to be always in confusion as to their place Paul said <laughs> God I got to read this out of the living Bible dear Lord help us Paul would have been voted out the deacons would have met right after service and said yeah he's no longer going to be over us he said for there are many among the church there who refuse to obey. This is especially true among those who say that all Christians must obey Jewish laws, but this is foolish talk. It blinds people to the truth. And it must be stopped. 
Already whole families have been turned away from the grace of God. Such teachers are only after your money. One of their own men, listen to this, oh my God. One of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, these men of Crete are all liars. You shouldn't call people liars. That's not your place. They are all lazy animals. You shouldn't say people are lazy. Okay. Living only to satisfy their stomachs. Oh, my God. You shouldn't call people gluttonous. And this is true. He was like, every bit of it's true. I'm not going to sit there and clean this up. Well, Paul, let's talk about this, brother. You're really messing up the church here. This, you know, don't you understand that really building a church is just as much public relations as it is ministry? No, it's not. Ministry is about taking the truth and giving it to the people. And sometimes it causes them to stand up and shout and dance, and then sometimes it causes us to weep. It's just the word of God. That's my job. That's the job of every minister. It is not to appease the congregation. It is to preach the truth. We have to understand this or we're always going to be in confusion. Always going to be in confusion. And there are people that tell me, oh, we like to be rebuked. No, you don't. You like when other people are rebuked. <laughs> when, I talk about, when I talk about drugs and alcohol, whoo, that's right, get them, Pastor. I mean, fornication and adultery. Get them, Pastor. I mean, kind of laziness and idleness. He needs to quit calling people lazy. I mean, them fornicators over there, they need to preach, preach to, but... He needs to quit calling people lazy. When I talk about stealing, could you talk about the drug addict? I mean, honest to God, because that's what the church has devolved into. The only behavior we want dealt with is the behavior that pertains to us before coming to Christ. Then we don't want our issues dealt with after coming to Christ. The devil is a liar. He that cannot receive correction doesn't have a father. He said, and this is true, so speak to the Christians there as sternly as necessary to make them strong in the faith. I think the King James has sharply rebuked them. I ain't going to no church like that. I'm not going to no church like You're not going to go to church then. You're going to go to an entertainment hall for the morally obligated who just sit there and pump up your flesh. We're trying to crucify the flesh around here. Come on, somebody. And sometimes that word has to come so strong that it pierces you. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is not a candy cane. That you want, when you want something sweet, you just go suck on it. Sometimes it's a sword and it cuts down deep. God he said rebuke them sternly rebuke them sharply speak to them as stern as you have to I mean you talk to them however you got to in order to open up their minds and cause them to be strong in the faith hmm. all right this is going to be good right here it's going to blow your mind for all of us that think preachers should just, I mean, Joel Steen is on TV every day if you want to watch somebody like that. That's not what I come to do. Honest to God, if you don't want nobody to deal with your spirit or your flesh or your mind, turn on the TV. Come on, somebody. But that's the job of ministry. It is, in fact, our responsibility. Oh, guys, put on your seatbelts here. This one's going to get rough. He said, 2 Corinthians 10, 1, I'm reading out the Living Bible. Oh, Lord, help us. We might have to have a whole prayer meeting before I read this. <laughs> he said, I plead with you. Yes, I, Paul, and I plead gently as Christ himself would do. He said, that's what I'm trying to do. He said, yet some of you are saying. He said, I went to you in love. I came to you so gently. <laughs> he said, this one's not on me, boys and girls. You did this to yourself. He said, yet some of you are saying Paul's letters are bold enough when he is far away. 
But when he gets here, he will be afraid to raise his voice. He said, he's just a coward, really. He just, he talks like that because ain't nobody there to challenge him. Oh, what a ignorant thing they did. <laughs> what a stupid thing they did. What a terrible thing they did. Because Paul wasn't going to take that lightly. Now, I know we all think that preachers, when they get come at, should just sit there and shut their mouth. Not say a word. Don't defend yourself. Don't say anything. Just keep your mouth shut. And let them say whatever they're going to say. You keep your mouth shut. Oh, this is not true. Because the problem is people running their mouth can persuade other people who are weak in the faith. It's not about protecting the preacher's ego. It's about protecting the people who are unstable. He said, I hope I won't need to show you when I come how harsh and rough I can be. I don't want to carry out my present plans against some of you who seem to think my deeds and words are merely those of an ordinary man. It is true that I am an ordinary, weak human being, but I don't use hum human plans and methods to win my battles. I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by men to knock down the devil's strongholds. These weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. With, with these weapons, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose hearts desire obedience to Christ. I will use these weapons against every rebel. Against every rebel. He said, I'm going to do it. Who remains after I have first used them on you yourselves and you surrender to Christ. He said, I'm going, he said when I get to Corinth, it's going to be war. I am not coming to you for a circus sideshow. I'm not coming to you to pet you. I'm not coming to you to play games with you. When I get to Corinth, it's going to be war. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There was a spirit that came into the church. And he was going to go to war and deal with the spirit. Amen. He said, the trouble with you is that you look at me and I seem weak and powerless. But you don't look beneath the surface. Yet if anyone can claim the power and authority of Christ, I certainly can. What is Paul talking about here? I mean, who does he think he is? Who, who does Paul think he is to be talking to people like this? He's dealing with rebellion saints that has made its way into Corinth and it was wrecking a church that he had worked so hard to build. Sometimes you may not understand why I come harshly after things. Sometimes you may not. You may say, Pastor, why are you being so harsh? Because I have spent 17 years of my life, blood, sweat, and tears committed to building this church. And I'm not going to let rebels come into this church and create division because they hate unity. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to let know-it-alls come into this church and create division because they think because they've read a few scriptures that they have a Ph.D. in theology and they know how the church should be run. The devil is a liar. Come on, somebody. It is not happening. If that makes me a control freak, I told you all, I told you all when I started preaching about this stuff, they were going to call us a cult. Happened. Happened. I'm a cult leader. Why? Because they're rebels. I'm not trying to demean them, but there's a spirit got a hold of some people. And they think that they're doing the work of God. But I'm going to tell you something, saints. There's sometimes you ought to just leave it alone. Come on. When they, the Sanhedrin brought Peter and John in and they threatened, they were going to kill him. Gamal said, wait. Leave it alone. But when people get corrected and then they get vicious, they get vile, and they start attacking character, and they start slandering men and women of God, that is a rebel spirit. That cannot allow, be allowed to work in the church if we are going to endeavor to keep the unity of the faith and the bond of peace. Come on, somebody. 
And I know that some of these are young Christians. They're baby Christians, but babies don't talk. Babies keep their mouth shut until they learn to speak correctly. Come on, somebody. I know that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. Just be quiet and learn. Be quiet and listen. It's not us that are going to fall. It's not us that are going to fail. You are captured by the enemy, and he's taken you out. God in heaven. Somebody said, don't embarrass people. I want to embarrass them. They should be ashamed of themselves. They should be so ashamed that they run to the altar and say, God, forgive me. Let me do what is right by your word. Let me do what is right by your church. Because they're the ones in jeopardy. We'll be here Sunday. We'll be here serving God with one another. We'll be here working together. We'll be here worshiping together. We'll be here praying together. We're not in jeopardy. We're not in jeopardy. But the Bible said they that separate themselves are sensual, not having the spirit. In other words, they're led by how they feel. They're not being led by the spirit of God. And they charge the church with things that don't belong to the church. That's the reason why you've got to walk in wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Before you start running off at your mouth and saying things that you don't even know what you're talking about, go find a saint of God who's holy, who's been walking with God. Well, I heard on YouTube. It doesn't matter what you heard on YouTube. You don't know those preachers. You don't know nothing about them. The Bible said, know them that labor among you. You have no clue what their lifestyle is, but you get around some people that are holy, living for God and sanctified. My God, get counsel. Don't just take to YouTube you don't know who they are and by the way they don't know who you are they don't love your soul they don't want to see you saved they want another view on their video so they can get advertisement money you're in jeopardy not me my God at one point Paul didn't know he was talking to the high priest and he railed on him and somebody came to him and said, don't you know that's God's high priest? And he was hit to his heart. Paul had the truth. The high priest was in error. But God remembered the word of God that said, don't you revile God's high priest. And he went back and repented to the man. Because he was like, who am I to talk about you? You're God's man. Who am I to rail against you? You're God's man. You want to talk about manipulation in the church? Let's talk about manipulation. The end time manipulation is not going to be from the pulpit to the pew. It's going to be from the pew to the pulpit. For in the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers who will tickle their ears. That's where the manipulation is coming from. Oh, say it, but say it this way. Oh, we want you to talk about it, but you've got to frame it in this. The devil is a liar. You have no business telling a man of God how he should preach the gospel if you don't like it, pray for the man. Hallelujah. We have to allow that manipulative spirit to go out of our hearts because it is a spirit of manipulation. And it's the same way you see it in homes. Husbands like zombies. The wife got her finger in his nose. Why are you going to church? Because my wife told me to. Why are you doing that? Because my wife told me to. Why are you doing this? Because my wife told me to. Because you know, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. It's a lie. It is deceit. It is a usurping of the authority of God in the home. And they think they can bring that same spirit into the house of God and try to put their finger in the pastor's nose and lead him around. The devil is alive. I'll cut the hand off right away. I will take the sword of the word and I'll cut your hand right off. It don't belong in my nose. Put it in the air and praise God. Glory to God. But they say we don't, we don't mind if you, we don't mind if you correct and rebuke pastor. Just say it like this. We, we don't mind if preachers preach hard, but use these terms. Teachers. 
And that's going to be the last day church, saints. The last day apostasy is not going to be men taking advantage of the people. It's going to be people usurping the authority over men of God. But God's going to leave a remnant to beat the buzzards off the sacrifice. Come on, somebody. Devil ain't going to get everybody. Come on, let him call you a cult. Let him call me a cult leader. And may God reward them for their wicked work. And God will. You shouldn't speak against men of God. It's one thing if men have done salacious things and immoral things. And, and, and that's one thing. But you don't ever, you don't ever speak against a man of God. I don't, I'm telling you, saints of God, you're just in trouble. Somebody said, well, I, give me scripture for that. Let me help you out. Elijah's just walking down the road. Just walking down the road. Bunch of kids come up to him. They didn't condemn his doctrine. They didn't talk about his preaching. They made fun of his appearance. Get up, old bald one. And a she-bear came out of the woods and ate him. My God. Were you not afraid? No, people are not afraid because I submit to no one but Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor tell him, are you sure about that? Go with me to Hebrews 13 and 17. Most of the problem we're having in the church is because people are ignorant of the word of God who think they know it. You don't know it. You don't know it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with you not knowing it. It doesn't make you less of a child of God. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It just means you don't have enough experience right now. Just keep studying. You'll figure it out. You'll find it out. Keep listening. Keep studying. Keep listening. You'll grow. The problem is the arrogance. It's the arrogance. I am telling you, saints, it's a spirit. It is a spirit that works in children of disobedience. It is in the home. My goodness gracious. I hear some of the children talking to their parents, and I think, dear God, my mother would have wrapped my teeth around the back of my head. What are you talking to your parents like that for? Because they think their parents are stupid and they don't know nothing. You go to school. Teachers, I, I wouldn't be a teacher in the secular school system if you paid me. Why? Because every time a teacher corrects a child, it's not let's have a parent-teacher meeting so we can get this child under control. It's let's have a parent-teacher meeting so I can tell you what you ain't going to say and do to my child. My little baby, you ain't going to know. No, not my little baby because their little baby's a victim. Their little baby's so victimized. So victimized. And it's the same way in the church. When people get offended, it's not their ugly spirit. It's not their ignorance to the word of God. They're victims. I'm such a victim. Where's the love of God? Where's the lo well, the love of God is supposed to be long-suffering. Where are you at? I thought you were supposed to be suffering long. <laughs> Love of God. The writer of Hebrews, maybe Apollos or Barnabas or Paul, he says this. He says, obey your spiritual leaders and be willing to do what they say. Cult. That's cult talk right there. Cult talk. That's not cult talk. Why did God give you pastors? Why did God give you apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers? Why are we here? To bring you into maturity so that you can do the work of the ministry. You think we want it all on our shoulders? No, we want to preach to you until you grow up in Christ to where you can take a hold of whatever God would give you to do within the household of faith and work and work and work and work. It's, come on, somebody. Obey your leaders and do what they say. <laughs> For their work is to watch over your souls. And God will judge them on how they do this. So take for instance, if, if you come in and I don't challenge you. I don't correct you. I don't rebuke when it is necessary. Where do you think I stand with God? When I don't encourage you, comfort you, help you, where do I stand with God? Saints of God, I don't, listen. I'd rather... It all go and be saved. Then to preach some palatable gospel to you. And then I stand before God lost. You don't understand. My goal is not to be the best pastor. My goal is to make it in the first resurrection. That provokes me to be the best pastor I can be. Because I know if I don't do my job, I won't make it. 
That's the reason why Paul said, I bring my body under subjection. Why? Lest I preach to you, then I'm cast away. I want to make it, saints. I want to go into the kingdom. My God, I want to see Jesus and know that I was pleased, that I pleased him. That's my, whole, that's my goal. That's my goal. Listen, that's the finish line for me. Not having 5,000 members, that's not the finish line for me. Not having huge facilities, not the finish line for me. God chooses to do all that, praise God. That's not my finish line. My finish line is when I can stay, say like Paul, who was in a Roman prison, going to die, and he said, I'm now ready to be offered. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is now therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, but not unto me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. I want to make it into the first resurrection if that means that i have to displease you i will displease you if that means at times i have to preach and it hurts your feelings i'll preach and hurt your feelings why because i answer to the lord my god in heaven i don't want to fail christ trying to please you he said give them reason to report joyfully about you to the Lord and not with sorrow for then you will suffer for it too my God what fear should be upon us that if a man of God should have to hit his knees on my behalf and say God they're so rebellious they won't do anything they won't listen they won't obey they won't submit how do you think that's going to happen what, what, what do you how do you think that's going to work out for you is that going to work out for your blessing, your benefit, your gain? God's going to come after you and say, I gave you a man of God that loved you. You won't listen to him. Now suffer for it. My God, saints, we have a responsibility to one another. Glory to God. 1 Peter 5 and 5. I'm trying to wrap this up. But this kind of preaching will build the church. This kind of teaching will build the house of God. You younger, follow the leadership of those who are older. Did you hear that? How upside down. I had a whole, I, years ago when, when we were in another building, I had a whole conglomerate, thank you of people coming in, they were young people. The moment they came in, they started demanding all these changes and we've got to brand ourselves. and if we want to be, if we want to reach people, we've got to do this and we need to change the music and we need to do this and we need to do all that and you need to do this and this is how you need to preach and blah, blah, blah. And they were going, and, and, and I'm just sitting here. I should have grabbed that thing right then and said, knock it off. You follow me as I follow Christ. But I didn't. You know what happened? Our church blew into a million pieces. Why? Because young came in demanding the old submit. When Peter said, you younger men follow the leadership of those who are older, or likewise you younger submit yourselves to the elder. And all of you serve each other with humble spirits. My God. Brother Earl said to me, I think it was today or yesterday, he goes, you're telling us we got to love one another, we got to serve one another, we got to work hard for the church, can't be lazy. What in the world is wrong with your spirit? Get it right, pastor. <laughs> Do you see how when the enemy gets into our minds, it renders us just absolutely ridiculous. We can't even think realistic thought it just blows our I mean it's like brother 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 uh, Deloy says the enemy gets into their cerebral cortex and renders them incapable of reasonable thought <laughs> we lose all rationale like it's it, it we go insane why because the enemy you say I don't believe the devil can do that yes he can and it's nice as a fire. Why has Satan filled thine heart that you should lie to the Holy Ghost? God, every thought that comes into your head is not scripture. Every, every thought that you have is not the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. 
The scripture is the scripture. I don't care how I think about it. I don't care how I feel about it. My God, there are times I've went to the word of God and it hurt me so bad I just wanted to close the book and run away. But my God, years later I thought, God, thank you that you gave me grace to listen because I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the person that I once was. I got some wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Oh God. We have to, and I'm telling you, saints of God, even in our homes, brothers, I'm not telling you to be aggressive and abusive to your wife. I'm not saying that at all. Don't you ever leave this place since I said that because you're supposed to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. But you're going to have to somehow hold on to the reins of leadership. You sisters that have husbands that want to serve God, quit fighting them. There are women in this church, they'd give everything they could to have a man of God in their life that would serve God. And you constantly fighting against them and resisting them or demanding they do this or demanding they do that. My God, you're fighting against the authority of Christ. It's not about that man. You're fighting Christ. And these men out here won't work to help their families. Won't support children. Come on, somebody. They don't care how, they don't care what they, they sit at home, play video games. My God, brother, submit to Christ. Submit to Christ. Get your head under Christ. And you can't do that lazy. You can't do that with no work ethic. You can't do that by just sitting around and watching TV for the Bible. Said a man that won't provide for his own, especially that of his own household, is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. There are so many men gather at church, fall out, speak in tongues, won't work. They ain't children of God. It's emotionalism. It's all mechanical. There's nothing real about it because God said, if you won't provide for your family, you don't belong to me. Get your head under the headship of Christ. Follow Christ. Take the reins. Tell your wife, I love you. But I'm going to tell you, if we don't, then men of God are going to stand before Christ their Savior. And he's going to look at them and say, why didn't you lead your home? Have you met my wife? Parents, quit letting your children run over you. I know they're cute. Not really. When they're screaming and hollering. I, I, had, I was watching the kids the other day and I had a couple little girls and they were in there and they started that screaming. So I said, you knock it off. I said, you're not going to scream in here while I'm in here. You're not throwing those fits. Okay, never did it again. Never did it again. And every time they went to, you know what they did? They went. I said, yeah, I think we got that one figured out. Not in here. Don't you let your children scream at you. Don't you let your children throw a tantrum. If they're old enough to throw a tantrum, they're old enough to get a spanking. Oh, glory to God. Not my little precious. Yes, you're a little precious. I'll stop there. You're a little precious. Get control of it. Our children shouldn't be dictating our homes. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and these two shall become one flesh. Those children are not one with you. They're your children, but there's only one flesh in that house, and that is between mom and daddy. And I'm going to tell you something. We've got that so twisted that children think that in their adulthood, their parents should still be providing for them. It is insane. No, you go out and you make a life for yourself. I'm not going to sit around and take care of all your business because you're too lazy to do it yourself. It is not my job. You're an adult now. I provided, you until I provided for you until I don't have to. Now go make your way. You say, that sounds abrasive and awful. Don't you love your children? I love my children. But as long as I keep them in the nest, they'll never fly. Oh, come on, somebody. It's not my job to pay your gas. It's not my job to pay your car payment. It's not my job to make your house payment. Come on, somebody. It's not my job to pay your insurance. It's not my job. I shouldn't be paying for your cable, your phone, your internet, your light bill. Praise the Lord. I ain't paying for your cigarettes, your alcohol, your marijuana. I ain't paying for none of it. You're an adult now. Get out there and do something with yourself. 
But it's so backward that children now, when their parents are even in their elderly ages, manipulating them. You do for me. You give to me. No. You cut it off. Why? Because you are fighting against the authority of Christ when you don't. Cut it off. You know what will happen? God will finally be in a position to deal with them. Do you know how many times we hinder God because we're thinking that we're, we have a savior complex. That's what it boils down to. No, switch that authority. No, I'm no longer daddy. I'm no longer mommy. My parents are not my daddy and my mommy anymore. I love them, love them, love them. I love my parents. I love them very much. And I'm closer to them now. I'm within five minutes of my parents' house. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, they're not my mommy and my daddy anymore. They're my friends. That relationship made a transition a long time ago. I don't depend on them for anything. They don't have to pay my rent, my light bill, my water. They don't buy my groceries. They don't pay my car payment. They don't buy my, pay my insurance. They don't do anything. My parents, how, how many bills do you all pay mine? How many bills do you all pay of mine? Want to know why? Because they're not my mommy and daddy anymore. They're my, my friends. And now I don't hang out with them like, Mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, I want something, give me, give me, give me, my name, give me, give me, give me, give me. No offense, Brother Jerry. But <laughs> that's just a rhyme. <laughs> but I, I want, just give me, I, you need to do something for me. You're my parents, you should. No, they shouldn't. I want to be my parents' friends now. I don't want them to be, I don't want them to be mommy and daddy to me anymore. I'm 40 years old, dog. I mean, come on. <sighs> we have to turn this upside down in our homes or turn it right side up. It's upside down. We've got to turn it right side up. We have to turn it right side up in the church. The pew doesn't have a right to dictate to the pulpit what it does. It never has and it never will. That came in through congregationalist churches where people thought they had power to vote in and vote out. And people that, listen, you didn't set me in this church. The Lord placed me here by his divine will and purpose. And somebody said, well, when do we get to vote? With your blessed feet. You don't like what's going on? <laughs> Glory to God. Vote with them feet, baby. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, go Titus 2, 1 and 8. I'll, I'll be done. <laughs> That's what our pastors told us. They said, vote with them feet. Because it's upside down. It's upside down. And somebody said, well, see, that's control and manipulation. It's not. It's God's authority. And the same people that think that ministers being God's uh, leadership over the church is control and manipulation and occultish are the same people who don't want authority in their home. They don't want authority of them, over them at all. They don't want nothing. They want to do what they want to do. They want to say what they want to say, and they don't want no accountability for it. It's not just in the church. You go to their homes, and I guarantee you, you're going to see the same picture. Because it's a spirit. It's carnal. It's devilish and ungodly. And they've given themselves over to it. They're captive of the enemy by his own will. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. But speak thou things which become a sound doctrine. Now listen to this. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and in patience. Elder men in the church should not be reckless. And they shouldn't be unfaithful. They should be, the elder men of the church should be the rock of the church. They should be the stability. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things. This is sound doctrine. That they may teach the young women to do what? Be sober. To do what? Love their husbands. I'm going to tell you something, saints. 
I cannot stand getting around women who complain about their husbands. No more than I can stand around stand getting around men who complain about their wives. We had a we had a men's prayer years ago, years ago. I I, I hadn't started this church yet. Years ago, and they said, "Oh, we're gonna have men's prayer and Bible study." I thought, "Oh, this is gonna be great. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it." We get there, and the only six weeks that I went, every time we got there, those men did nothing but bellyache and gripe about their wives. That's all they did the whole time. It was a gripe session about their wives. And I was like, I'm not married yet. I ain't staying around you guys because I'd like to be married at some point. And after I hear you talk, I don't want to be married. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Peace. I was like, this is not a Bible study. This is a gripe session for men who need to, you know, tighten their drawers up a little bit. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, glory to God. <laughs> You sisters ought to teach, you elder sisters ought to be teaching these younger women to love their husbands. And some of them have husbands that are not godly. They're not serving God, and that's a hard road to hoe. That's a hard road to hoe. But there are some of you sisters in here that have that experience. And because you kept your faith right, because you kept your conversation right, because you didn't compromise what God had done in your life, your husbands came in. Teach these sisters. This is your job. This is sound doctrine. But in order to be taught, you have to be submitted. Oh, praise God. To love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. <laughs> oh, dear God, help us, Jesus. That means you shouldn't be running off to the mall. Or anywhere else taking up your time if your home's a mess. Your husband shouldn't have to go to work all day to come home to a house that is in complete disarray. And if both spouses are working, both of them need to be working on that. Your children should not be raised in chaos. And there is nothing more chaotic than what? Coming into a house where you're having to walk over yesterday's clothes in order to get to the couch. Oh, praise God. Good. Oh, sisters, hold on, all right? Put your seatbelt on. Obedient to their husbands. Everything is backward. Everything is backward. Now the wives should be obeying, or the husband should be obeying the wife. Because if mama ain't happy, it is completely antithetical to the scripture. And the reason why God is not smiling on the church as he wants to is because the authority is upside down. If this church, regardless of the outside dissenting voices, let the heathen rage. Let them rage. They're going to do it. If we'll turn the authority upside, right side up in our homes and in the church, God's going to pour out his blessing on us. We're going to have peace. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Don't be silly. I, I mean, at times we have fun, right? We can jest and have fun. Merry heart doeth good like medicine. But there's a difference. There's got to be a line that comes that everything is not silly. Everything is not funny. I've, I've, I've preached amongst people that they would sit there and they would crack up because they would take words and turn them into stupid phrases while I'm preaching. That's a silly man. That's a man that's got arrested development. He's not grown up. He's still five years old in a 25, 30-year-old body. Amen. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That means don't let your language be vulgar. Don't let your language, and, and vulgar language doesn't mean you use curse words. Come on, somebody. There are things you shouldn't be talking about. The Bible said it is unseemly to speak of those things which are done in the darkness. There are things that goes on in your bedrooms you shouldn't be talking to other men about. If you need a trophy, ask your wife. If she hadn't given you one, pray. <laughs> Glory to God. You don't need to go to your friends and brag about your accomplishments in the bedroom. Woo! 
so that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say to you. As men and women of God, I'll stop right there. there. There's so much I could talk about, but it's getting late. But as men and women of God, our lives should be circumspect and holy. It should be. So that people who are not living in such a way, they'll be ashamed. And I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with people being ashamed of their behavior. There's nothing wrong with people being embarrassed of their actions. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. If people would just yield to that conviction and repent, God would cause them to grow and mature. At some point, you have to quit going around the same mountain. Come on, somebody. It's absolutely the truth. In the church, the pew does not have a right to dictate the ministry. I'm telling you, saints, I know that may hurt your feelings, and maybe you're like, well, I ain't going to no church where I can't have some say-so in it. Well, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You want to have some say-so? Talk about the Lord and how he redeemed you. Come on, somebody. Otherwise, hold your peace. Let the Lord fight the battle. Amen. The Bible says if, 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 if you're doing right, then when the spirit of the ruler rises against you, God will deal with them. It's the absolute truth. Amen. I've watched God. I've watched God in my life. There, there have been times I've gotten, I've gotten way off. And guess what? God didn't leave me alone. He wore my tail out until I had to repent. We're not exempt from that. The pulpit is not exempt from that. But we've got to turn this upside down. I'm not taking a vote from you. I don't need a popular opinion from the pew. We're going to follow Christ. And we're going to serve the living God. And God's going to do amazing things in our lives and through our lives. We're going to work hard together. There is nothing more joyous than working together, saints, as children of God. Amen. Amen. We had, I mean, we had an awesome day. It sounded like y'all did in cleaning here Saturday and working at the house Saturday afternoon. And God's people were enjoying fellowship, talking about the goodness of the Lord. They were singing, rejoicing. That's who we are. You don't have home life, church life. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. We only have one life, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Saints of God, let us love one another. And when you have voices that are salacious and slanderous, Paul said, whose mouths must be stopped. Shut them up. They call you and start slandering a child of God in the church, or they come to you and start slandering the pastor or slandering leadership or slandering anyone that belongs to God in your life you tell them hold your peace my my ears are not trash cans you take your garbage somewhere else and I'm going to tell you something you can talk you can tell where people's spirits are when they get all their rear end up all in the air when they start aligning with rebels when they start aligning with people who are in rebellion against the church who have an offense and are angry against the church you know where their spirit is right away don't align with those people. Turn from those people. Turn from them. Pray for them, but turn from them. Amen. And God will deal with them. Listen, I, I believe there's more hope for a live dog than a dead lion. As long as there's breath in people's body, God can save them. But there are sometimes we just have to deliver them over. You say, that sounds horrible. Okay, there was a man sleeping with his father's wife. Obviously, it was a polygamous relationship. It didn't say he was sleeping with his mother. It said he was sleeping with his father's wife. Paul said, you deliver one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved in the day of, in, of, the day of judgment. How harsh is that? But you know what happened? By the time he went to pen 2 Corinthians, that man's spirit had gotten right, and he had repented. He said, now you receive him back, lest he be overwhelmed with much sorrow. I don't want people to stay out of the church forever. You're going to watch people come in that have failed, that maybe even we've had to give over. We can't afford to be that kind of church that when we see true, sincere repentance, that we look at them and like, man, why would you come back? Oh, no, let them come back. Let's the, de let's the devil take advantage of them and overwhelm them with much sorrow. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some times that I'm going to say, not until you're sincere. 
You say, Pastor, why would you do that? Because it doesn't make any difference. You keep letting people come back and they keep disrupting the unity of the church. All you're doing is holding the church at bay, trying to protect some spirit that is not of God. Amen. So you shut people down like that. You don't agree with them. And you ain't got to, you ain't, listen, Christianity doesn't mean I have to treat everybody with kid gloves. There are some people I just have to say, I don't want to hear it. And no, I don't need to make you feel good in order to feel like I'm a Christian. If your spirit is nasty and all you're going to do is slander God's people and slander God's work and slander God's ministry, you hold your peace. And the next time we talk, you'll be praising God and you'll be thanking God for God's goodness or we won't have a conversation. You say, is that true? Yes. Paul said, you turn away from them. You turn away from them. Why? Because it's hard to be alone. And loneliness will deal with people. Amen. Amen. Because the ultimate desire is that everyone that God brings into our presence be saved. And some of, those, some of us will come in and, my God, we'll be here forever. Others are going to have to, Brother Voris used to say, you'll either walk through the door or God will drag you through the knot hole. One way or the other. Sister Opal used to say, my mama told me, if you don't listen, I guess you'll just have to feel <laughs> Amen. I hope, you, I hope you understand, saints, what I'm talking about tonight. In your homes, at your workplaces, and I'm telling you, whether you have kids that go to school here or kids that go to school in the secular education, now if they're being abused or molested or whatever, but because somebody told your little child no, doesn't mean that they're abusive. Correction is not abusive. In fact, it is more abusive to not correct. Amen. And so when you hear rebuke or chastise, even from the pulpit, and people say, oh, that we're, there's no love there. No, that's love. Whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges every son whom he receives. He beats them. That's what it says. That's what it says. Oh. That's just not who I am. That's not my Jesus. That's because you have another Jesus. Amen. Let us understand that we do serve a merciful Savior, and he is so kind and loving. But when he has to, when he must, when we won't listen, you have to understand the only time God uses those methods is when we won't listen. Because the goodness of the Lord is what leads us to repentance. But when we won't hear his goodness, He'll pull out the rod and deal with us until we listen. Jesus said it this way. You will fall on the rock and break. Or the rock will fall on you and grind you into powder. The difference is the time of restoration. Because it's a whole lot easier to restore pieces than powder. Oh, glory to God. Amen. What a wonderful word we've heard from the Lord tonight. This is good instruction, saints. And you say, Pastor, are you going after specific issues? I sure am. I'm not hiding it. We're not going to have it. I am going to fight as hard as I can to keep unity in this church. I don't want division here. What we saw here Sunday night, my God, you know what that was? That was God honoring his word. That was God confirming his word. Saints, when you feel the power of God come into the church like that, God saying, yeah. Then I look down here, and Sister Michaela's down here getting the breakthrough, and I look around her, and who's around her? Young and older women. Them older women got in her ear and began to pray with her, began to push her. My God in heaven. Treated her as a daughter. That's the point. That's why she got a breakthrough, because there was unity. There was a cohesive unity of the Spirit. There was joy in here. I mean, there was glory in this house. Even Sunday morning, I know that was a hard message, but my God, what anointing. Did you hear Sister Monique's tongues and interpretation? I was, listen, I was battling preaching that message on Sunday morning. I kid you not, I was like, Lord, God, Lord, help me. I don't know how to, and she gives the tongues and interpretation, and I'm sitting there going, all right. <laughs> I just took my seatbelt off, put her down in fifth gear, and hit the pedal as hard as I could. God's with us, and if God be for us, nobody will successfully stand against us.
They'll talk. It's just talk. But you can't allow that into your heart, and you can't allow it to continue to be talked to you. Amen? All right, we're going to take up our tithes and our offerings. Get that turned around, saints, in your heart, in your home. Everywhere you go, just everywhere God's given you influence, get that turned around. Let the authority be right. Because God loves, God loves, God loves order and authority. He loves it. Father, we thank you so much for the honor and the privilege and the pleasure we have had to be in your house tonight. We thank you for the word of God that we have heard that has been so powerful to touch our lives. And maybe even God in us, it has dealt with thoughts and intents. And we thank you, God, that you have not left those things uncovered, but God, you have revealed them by your light. Now, I pray for this offering that you would bless it, bless the gift and the giver, bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right, brothers, come. Amen. Let's give as the Lord has blessed us. Saints, we want to, you can just keep it playing just low, Zan. But <laughs> I think, <coughs> pardon me, we were going to be moving, we were going to be moving this Saturday. That has changed. Um, we've got a, a little bit more to do before we move. Um, so the plan is next Saturday, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday we'll be moving. We're going to need as much help as we can get. Uh, however, we will be working as normal on Saturday. Uh, for those that would like to come and help, we just got a few things that we need to finish up. Um, again, for the kids, there's not going to be any school tomorrow or Friday. Um, my sister Shonda is going to be working and to uh, to pack. I'll be working with Brother Earl to continue to build. The house is just starting to come together. It's looking so beautiful. It really is. You won't even recognize it, Sister Carolyn. You won't even recognize it. <laughs> but it's going to be beautiful. Um, so if you'd like to help... Uh, We'll be there on Saturday from 8 to 4.30. I know some of you clean. Uh, some came after cleaning. We appreciated it so much. Um, we want to remember Family Fun Night is this Friday at 7 p.m. So let's remember that. Sister Leslie, thank you all for all of you that went and helped her pack up. Thank you so much. What a blessing. What a tremendous blessing. What an awesome blessing. It's just a family. God. That's what we do. That's what I'm trying to get across. This is who we are. We're the family of God. And so thank you all so much. I know that Sister Laverne and Sister Leslie was blessed by the help that was given. Um, we also want to remember um, my nephew, Brayden, in our prayers. Really need, He needs a miracle, saints. He has got a really serious condition. He needs a miracle. Uh, Brother John Zonneville, I believe they're having his service uh, this weekend in Bradenton, so let's pray for his family. Sister Nancy Monreal, miss her. I hope she's going to be back soon. Um, Big Al, Sister Mary Lou, uh, the family, Sister Jody's daughter, Rindy and Walt Johnson in Des Moines. Uh, we want to pray for Cameron. Uh, he's got the big C word. We want to pray that God will heal him. Pray for Jeremiah. He had some dental work done today. I'm trying to think. Who else?
sociales. Wake him up. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll pray. Absolutely pray. All right, saints of God. Brother David, come dismiss us in order of prayer. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for the service. Oh, God, we pray. Lord, what a joy it was, God, to hear your word come forth, God. I received it. Oh, God, with much gladness. Oh, God, it was so good to my soul, oh, God. So, Father, we alone give you the praise for that, God, and we ask, God, that you would continue, God, or bring forth these messages, oh, God, that are conforming us, God, into the image of your dear Son, oh, God, we pray. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that we would all take heed to the Word of God, Lord, with, with sincerity, O oh God. Lord, let us just take heed to the Word of God. And Lord, use us, God, as you would see fit, O oh God. Let us be pliable with the Word of God. Lord, humble, ready to receive the Word of God with gladness, O oh God. But Lord, let us always be pliable as children of God to receive that Word, Lord, that's able to save our souls, O oh God. And Lord, we just pray, God, over the prayer request, God, that means God. Lord, uh, her son, oh God, will watch over him, God, I pray, God, that you would let him see himself in the eyes of God. Let him see the need, God, for Jesus. Let him see the need for salvation, oh God. Lord, I pray that you reach down with your long arm of love, God, and into his heart, God, and touch his heart, oh God, and cause him to repent, God, and come to you, oh God, we pray. Lord, touch the sick, oh God, cause him to recover, oh God, we pray. Lord, and let us never fail, but God, to give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.